Hello, everyone. So we're ready to start this uh, meeting on Kosovo after the elections. And it's uh, a big pleasure to uh, welcome and open this meeting with uh, a lot of interesting uh, speakers and uh, here to discuss a very interesting uh, situation in Kosovo. And we also have uh, two MEPs with us who will also be speaking and giving their input and MEPs that are, that are following uh, Kosovo closely. So, my name is Peter Sondergaard. I'm the director of programs here at the European Endowment for Democracy. We've been working in the Western Balkans, including Kosovo, since 2018. So we are obviously following the situation uh, very closely. And uh, we see that, that um, Kosovo's democratic uh, consolidation often happens with uh, big events, uh, the constitutional crisis, uh, dialogue with Serbia and other things. And uh, now we've seen the outcome of this election which was not a surprise, but was still a big event in terms of uh, providing the path for a peaceful transfer of power, which is a, a big thing. And uh, with the, now the government being run by Vita Vendosia and Albin Kurti, that opens a lot of uh, questions that we'll be discussing today. How much uh, Kurti and the government will prioritize dialogue, how they will handle individual freedoms, and uh, most important, and that was part of, of course, the election campaign, how to handle uh, corruption in, in Kosovo. So those are some of the questions that we'll be discussing uh, today. I have to say that from my side, uh, I have followed Kosovo on off, um, but uh, my, actually my, my first introduction to Kosovo was uh, back in 96, 97, meeting Albin Kurti as a uh, student union leader in Copenhagen. And uh, he was back then instrumental in getting Kosovo on the international agenda and also mobilizing us uh, European students at that point to, to talk about Kosovo. And, and later we were campaigning for his release when he was having long hair down to the back of his uh, half of his back and uh, being, I think, almost like a Jesus figure. So in, in that way, it's, it's quite interesting to, to see that now he's uh, prime minister of Kosovo. And in that way, that quarter of a century has been quite a path and achievement for him. And obviously, uh, those things that we were standing for uh, in the student unions back then, uh, uh, peaceful and uh, constructive uh, international dialogue is not always the things that have been on top of his agenda. But, but in that, uh, from that personal connection with him, um, I will be looking very interested and, and also hopeful in terms of seeing how he will handle this majority that he has now won uh, in the election. So with those few words uh, from my side, uh, I would like to pass the floor, but also thanking all 
uh, ED colleagues who have been working very hard to put this uh, this together and uh, and um, putting in front of us a very interesting uh, discussion. So, with those words, I pass the floor to you, Valerie, and thanks to everyone for participating. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you so much to the European Endowment for Democracy for asking me to moderate what might be my favorite panel of, of this month, at least, um, because we're going to talk about the fallout from the elections in Kosovo. And I think uh, every year in Kosovo has been eventful, at least since I've been following it. But throughout 2020, Kosovo went through a series of political institutional crises. There were three prime ministers in just one calendar year. Uh, the sitting president uh, was indicted for war crimes and, and went to The Hague along with the former Speaker of Parliament. Um, and on Valentine's Day this year, uh, Kosovo held extraordinary elections and uh, Levizia Vetendosia, the self-determination movement, a political party that has been in the opposition throughout most of its uh, decade long existence, won uh, what many consider to be a landslide victory. For the first time in Kosovo's history, a political party will be able to form a government only with the support of national minority parties as required by the constitution. So, uh, and while the election was generally deemed free and fair, significant irregularities were reported in Serb populated areas. Uh, most of the 10 guaranteed parliamentary seats for Kosovo Serbs were won by Srpska Lista, which has very, very close and direct ties to the Serbian president, Aleksandar Vucic. Um, and the cooperation between Albanian and Serb members of parliament is, remains extremely variable and often tense um, and, and subject, of course, to many, many political games led by both Pristina and Belgrade. Uh, Vetvindosia and its leader, Albin Kurti, ran an anti-opposition, anti-corruption campaign, excuse me, uh, focused on jobs and justice. Um, and they have vowed to tackle important issues like the depoliticizing, what they say is a captured state, um, and of course, other issues like low quality education, economic stagnation, and high unemployment, especially among youth that are all going to be much even more challenged by the pandemic. Um, and at the same time, uh, Kosovo is still under a lot of international pressure to conclude negotiations with Serbia. Uh, which, and, but according to statements during and after the campaign, um, this dialogue with Serbia is not going to be um, incoming Prime Minister Kurti's top priority. So I think that the EED has assembled a really fascinating panel with a diverse array of commentators to talk about this. So I am going to stop. But before I introduce the, well, I'll introduce the panel and then I will hand it over to our, to Lucas Mandel who will open us up. So on the panel, as you know, which is probably a reason why you've joined this, we have Vlora Chitaku, who is the former ambassador of Kosovo to the United States, who I last saw in Washington before the pandemic, uh, Visar Umeri, uh, the director of the Musinia Kokolari Institute for Social Politics, and the former chairman of Edvindosia, who has tremendous insights into how the party works and its leadership. Uh, we also have Labdim Hamidi, the editor-in-chief of Front Online, who is joining us from Pristina. And we have Jovan Radosavljevic, the director of the New Social Initiative, who is joining us from Mitrovica. So, um, Without further ado, I'd like to, we will have a comment also at the end from Fiola von Kramon, who is a member of European Parliament from the Greens, um, from the German Greens, and the, who is the rapporteur for Kosovo. But I want us to be kicked off by Lukas Mandel, who I guess is joining us from the European Parliament live, who is an Austrian MEP, I think all of you are probably familiar with him, uh, from the EPP group, um, and is, are you the, uh, chairman of the Friends of Kosovo group in the parliament. Maybe you can, maybe you can tell us uh, in your remarks. Thank you, Lucas. The floor is yours. Thank you, Valerie. Thanks to the center for having me today. I send my regards from Brussels. I'm more than happy uh, about the opportunity to contribute with uh, initial remarks for today's discussion among distinguished people. Really, it's a great panel you put together today in order to figure out what's ahead for the Republic of Kosovo and especially for its people. Uh, with us today is also Viola von Kramon, who is a rapporteur of this very parliament on Kosovo. And I have the privilege to head uh, the Kosovo Friendship Group here in this European Parliament. Uh, uh, I'm also uh, heading the uh, Austria-Kosovo Friendship Group in my home country, Austria. And I have been, uh, let's say, dealing with uh, Kosovo related issues for many years and I'm more than grateful for uh, good cooperation with so many people from Kosovo from many different political parties from many different disciplines uh, and what's ahead for Kosovo uh, can be a positive era uh, I'm optimistic 
uh, and I want to convey this optimism and I want to ask each and everybody to join me in this optimism because uh, what we need is a positive outlook. Uh, and I would put it that way, what the people of Kosovo deserve uh, is stability uh, in the public uh, administration and in politics generally. Uh, and what the people of Kosovo also deserve is reforms, uh, namely in the field of rule of law. This was already mentioned uh, today, uh, but also in the field of education, in the field of health and in many other fields. Uh, and the people of Kosovo also deserve, I would say, uh, a republic and uh, let's say a head of the republic, uh, which uh, provides the world with a clear, positive image especially of stability. Stability seems to be so important uh, to me for this very republic. And after this election result, which is actually a major success of Arbin Kurti and Viosa Osmani, uh, there are good uh, circumstances for future stability, I would say. Uh, what's ahead uh, in terms of technical steps that have to be taken is uh, the constitution of the parliament then forming a government uh, uh, as uh, with as much stability as possible and then of electing a president and this has to be done as far as i know uh, at the latest by may 5th uh, because after that uh, if uh, things would not be accomplished then the constitution uh, as an expert once said would be silent the constitution of the republic of kosovo uh, on further steps. So that's uh, one of the reasons why it's so important to make these steps as soon as possible and to include as much as possible uh, political forces in Kosovo into that process. And maybe that's the obligation of Arbin Kurti and Yusuf Osmani today to, uh, let's say, interact with each and every elected official and their political parties in order to uh, gain the majorities that are needed, not only to form the government, but especially to elect the president, uh, which, which uh, needs a large majority in parliament and is of utmost importance for what? For the already mentioned stability uh, and uh, the reforms I have mentioned also needs this stability. And it will, uh, it will also be important, let's say, for uh, the impression Kosovo provides the world with, provides the European Union with, uh, also in the dialogue. The dialogue is, uh, of course, of utmost importance. It's also uh, among the things that the people of Kosovo deserve, that there will be a normalization, yes, a mutual recognition achieved with Serbia. I can understand that uh, many people find it boring, even as boring as still waiting for visa liberalization. I understand that completely, but since things are not yet done, they still have to be done and we have uh, to work on them the vast majority of uh, this very parliament here uh, stands by the side of the Kosovo people. We uh, uh, are happy to convey this message. I guess Viola von Kamon uh, uh, agrees in that point. Uh, and that this is why many people also on European level run for the long-term already deserved visa liberalization for the people of Kosovo uh, and also run for a proper process in the normalization and mutual uh, recognition with Serbia, which is for both of the countries, Kosovo and Serbia, of utmost importance for their further European integration process, uh, which will be important for all Europe. And maybe this is my last third, uh, point in this initial remarks, that actually uh, what the European Union provides the Western Balkan countries with is not a gift. Uh, it's in the very interest of the citizens of today's EU member states, uh, the 27 of them, and actually it's in the very interest of each and every European, no matter whether uh, she or he lives in a member state or not, because the Western Balkans clearly belong to Europe, the uh, European attitude identifying with European values and with European uh, integration is large in the Western Balkan countries. Citizens believe uh, into European values, that's why uh, we have to do all that we can in terms of reforms domestically in the Republic of Kosovo and the five other Western Balkan countries, as well uh, in terms of uh, European Union priorities, which are clearly, uh, 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 which clearly include the Western Balkans uh, on a very, very high level. That's why, why we uh, work on everything of this. It's uh, not about the political talk alone. It's especially about what the people of Kosovo deserve after decades of suffering, actually, in many different fields. Uh, 
they need jobs, they need opportunities. Jobs come when investments come, and investments will come when rule of law is in proper place. This is a one connection to the political reforms that have to be undertaken domestically. And there are also a lot of connections for the international image. I have confidence into Albin Kurti and Piyosa Osmani that they use their power uh, democratically legitimized now for these steps I tried to figure out. And of course, we always talk with the Kosovo on the same level. So uh, it's one of the trouble of the past that Kosovo was uh, shown up at the whole Western Balkans actually were shown up with uh, imposement from outside on what would be right. No, that's not my approach. I just share my opinion. I try to stand by the people of Kosovo and do my work as a, a European elected official in the interest of Europe. Uh, and that's why we talk on, 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 on the same level and uh, mutually and as good as we can. Uh, I look forward to the outcomes of today's discussions. Due to time restraints, I have to jump to a different meeting, but uh, I will look into the discussion afterwards and I wish you all the best. And I again congratulate you to the uh, really great uh, compilation of speakers you have on this panel today. All the best from Brussels. Vielen Dank, Lukas. Uh, thank you so much. Um, without further ado, I, I want to ask Vlora, um, Ambassador Chitaku, about uh, what Lukas said, uh, that, Kosovo, you, that Kosovo deserves to send a clear, positive image of stability uh, and uh, a bit capacity for reforms. Um, you are one of the people best placed to talk about how Kosovo is viewed uh, in the world and, and by its allies, especially. Did these elections uh, send that kind of message and, and are you confident um, that that's what will be projected by the new government? Uh, thank you very much, Valerie, and thank you very much to uh, all of the panelists. This is a very timely discussion. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that the most important takeaway from these elections is that in Kosovo, democracy works. In contrast to other nations, both in the region and beyond, uh, where the rotation of power is often followed with protests, riots, and unrest in Kosovo. The results were announced the very same night. They were uncontested. In fact, they were gracefully accepted. The 14th of February effectively debunked the notion that Kosovo is a captured state. Our institutions work and our democracy functions. Another element which I want to highlight is the women's vote. Exit poll data shows that the women's vote was decisive in these elections. In a country that's just two years younger than Twitter, the high probability that we will have second woman president is a sign of emancipation. The incoming government will certainly have a full plate and everything is a priority. In terms of foreign policy, dialogue is not a choice. It's inevitable. The status quo is unsustainable and the situation will either improve or implode. The question is not whether Kosovo is ready to come to the table because Mr. Kurti has won a very clear mandate. The real question is whether EU is ready to do its part. It is important for the Europe, European Union to realize that they are not competing with the United States on this. The EU and US are complementary influences in the Western Balkans. It would be very wise for EU to take advantage of the new US administration's willingness to cooperate on these matters. As someone who's served as Minister of European Integrations and Ambassador to the United States, I've seen both capitals up close and know them uh, very well. I can say that both EU and US support the integration of the Western Balkans uh, into the European family, and they both agree on the result. But what they differ is the preferred pace. EU is more process oriented, uh, US is more result oriented. While process is important, uh, we need to remind ourselves that process is only a tool. It cannot be 
replaced uh, and it cannot become an objective on its own. We must all keep in mind that we are not in 99, this is not 2008, we are in 2021. The world has changed and there are different elements at play. We are faced with increasingly aggressive Russia, a more present China, a mix in the COVID-19 pandemic, which has left us hanging by a thread economically. Uh, the entire region and Kosovo in particular are very fragile. Now more than ever, uh, we need clarity from our international partners. And I sincerely hope that European Union will do its job. Uh, Kosovo is by far the most pro-EU country in the region and beyond, but our re relationship with EU cannot remain uh, platonic. People of Kosovo need to be able to travel and enjoy our continent. Uh, we've always had to be uh, A plus students to get a C minus. Uh, we were given twice as many criteria for, for visa liberalization. And we have met every single one of them as the commission has very often stated. And I really wanna thank Viola for bringing this up uh, each time she can. And I would encourage her to, to continue to do so because people in Kosovo do not deserve to be treated as a second class Europeans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiora. That was a powerful note to end on and one I think we can all agree upon. Um, Vissar, I want to ask you, I was struck by the one of the, the turns of phrase that Viora used about now is the time to improve or implode, uh, which of course is very dramatic, but I think a lot of people uh, who voted for Vetendosia uh, and for this uh, Osmani Kurti ticket, shall we say, uh, I probably feel that way. Um, the expectations are really high. Um, what do you... What does this result mean and, and, and what does that kind of landslide show about, about the voters in Kosovo, about what they expect and, and do you think that it's going to be possible in this, amid this global pandemic that their expectations be met as fast as they want them to be? Okay because I was muted, sorry. Well, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, organizing this event, which I also uh, find very interesting and important, and a very uh, uh, fruitful discussion and constructive discussion on what is happening in Kosovo and what might as we expect to happen. Uh, to go back to your question, uh, Valerie, I think that uh, as you've mentioned, and as everybody else I think uh, knows, the expectations of the people in Kosovo are very high. Uh, the most common uh, 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 sentence that you hear around the elections and after the elections uh, was that this is our final chance. So basically the voters in Kosovo, so especially the Kurti Osmani ticket as the last uh, potential uh, uh, breakthrough for Kosovo in order to uh, achieve the reforms promised and the reforms of people uh, see necessary uh, for us uh, or for Kosovo to become uh, closer to EU and uh, for the people in Kosovo to have a better life. And I think that uh, this is in a way how uh, this relationship has been built between the political discourse which was present, presented by Kurti and Osmani, who have been, uh, I think, and especially Kurti has been uh, very uh, successful into uh, 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 the, uh, constructing a sort of a very simplified uh, truth about uh, what is going on in Kosovo. So a very complex uh, development uh, uh, of the country 20 years after the war has been simplified into a one sentence, which means that corruption is uh, not letting us develop and corruption is the biggest obstacle uh, that uh, for us to move forward. So basically, I think that the expectations that the people have built is that once corruption is fought and taken care uh, of, uh, then uh, this is going to open the way for more jobs, more development, uh, visa liberalization, a better education system, a better health system. 
And uh, uh, the problem here is that uh, uh, first, uh, this simplified truth uh, is never true. Uh, and the second thing is that even if this was true, even if the sequence of the things were as it was promised, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the time limit within which these can happen uh, are much broader than the people are uh, waiting and hoping uh, that it will uh, uh, happen. So in this sense, uh, I think that uh, uh, not just that uh, Kurti is becoming or potentially becoming a prime minister in a very sensitive and uh, delicate, I would say, situation, uh, but also I think that the expectations from him are much higher than they were ever uh, from any politician. And I think that the vote actually says this. Uh, this landslide victory and the results were never seen in Kosovo since 2000. Uh, when straight after the war, uh, LDK, led by uh, uh, late President Ibrahim Rugova, has reached such a percentage of the votes. So 47% uh, were then uh, with LDK and around 47-48% we have now with Vindosi. So this was an, un an unprecedented result. And uh, uh, in this sense, I think that uh, uh, what, uh, what is happening and what has happened in 14th of February in Kosovo actually is a closure of a uh, chapter of the past and an opening of a new chapter. So basically people, voters in Kosovo are very well aware of what they are running away from. So they are running away from what they perceive as 20 years of uh, corruption, nepotism, mismanagement, organized crime, and a lot of different failures of the state of Kosovo. Uh, failures these that they assign to particular political parties, especially LDK and PDK. But they are not very sure and they have not very, uh, they have not been very attentive to where they are running to. So basically, we know what we're leaving behind, but we don't really know what we are entering into. And in this sense, I think that uh, I, I, if this uh, vote, the 14th of February vote, is more uh, a punishment vote for the uh, traditional parties rather than necessarily a victory vote for Vendosia and Osman. Now, obviously, uh, in reality, you can never divide these as the, the way that I did now uh, by idealizing the two points in order for us to be able to make an analysis. In this sense, I think that Kurti is a very important uh, political uh, figure, especially the way that he is perceived by the population. And it is very interesting what Peter, in, in, uh, Peter initially said about uh, Kurti when he met him, that he had this uh, Jesus-like figure because of his hair. I think that Kurti has lost his hair, but he is trying to maintain his Jesus-like figure uh, because he is trying to present this new hegemony, uh, which uh, uh, which presents him or perceives him as uh, this sort of like messianic political figure, the savior that is going to take Kosovo into the future. And uh, without him, Kosovo would never be able to go into the future. So I think that in this sense, uh, Kurti has been successful into beating the traditional uh, uh, political parties, uh, especially uh, uh, PDK and LDK. And I have to say that he has been very uh, well helped in this direction by themselves, uh, because especially the way that he was brought down last year and uh, the, the new government that was established uh, with its, uh, uh, with its uh, quite lengthy uh, uh, register of uh, non-successes has helped Kurti a lot into his uh, electoral uh, uh, sympathy growing. Uh, so in this sense, uh, Kurti is, is, uh, uh, is a, a sort of a politician, I would say, uh, that uh, inherits best of both worlds. So basically he has uh, this, uh, uh, this aura of, of, a, of, a, of a person who is uh, a, 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 a very uh, good and intellectually uh, well endowed politician. Uh, he's not uh, corrupt. Uh, he has this moralistic uh, superiority towards the other uh, politicians. He has been an actor during the 90s and he has been a political actor after the 90s until the, today. So basically he has been in all of the political worlds uh, of uh, uh, that Kosovo uh, went through. Uh, if I may do a comparison, uh, I think that the, the majority of political legitimacy for, let's say, the late President uh, Rugova and also for uh, ex-Prime Minister and ex-President uh, Thaci, uh, their political legitimacy uh, 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 in majority stemmed from the 90s. 
And the Kurdish political majority, I think, stems from the 90s, but also from after the war because of his uh, uh, political activism uh, during Bedbendosia since 2005, and then the uh, being active in Kosovo's assembly as well. So in this sense, I think that Kurti is this uh, sort of what I might describe as the vanishing mediator, as this political vehicle, which is necessary to close the chapter of the 90s, which I think has uh, uh, has uh, went on until uh, these elections, and to open the new chapter of the future Kosovo, where Kurti is, I think, going to be just this bridge uh, where uh, uh, to link these uh, these uh, uh, two, two chapters. As it was said by uh, all of you, and I just would like to reiterate that, is that uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, questions that arise from a Kurti uh, government. First, the immediate question is, uh, how is the government going to be established? According to the latest uh, information, and I think that uh, tomorrow or uh, the latest, we are going to have the final results. It seems that the Kurti Osmani ticket does not have more than uh, 58 members of parliament, which means that they need uh, some additional members of parliament in order to establish a government. And this is going to be the obstacle number one, being that uh, as uh, we uh, uh, know, and as I think Yovana is going to talk a bit more in, in length on this, and uh, current, in this uh, assembly, we are going to have a different uh, situation when it comes to representative of the minority communities, uh, being that uh, the Serbian list uh, parliamentary group is going to be bigger than 10 members of parliament. So in this sense, uh, Kurti has always hoped that his government is going to be established by his own uh, a party uh, with the help of the non serb minority uh, representatives in the assembly. And now this is becoming even harder by being that a part of uh, the reserve seats for Bosniaks and Romans are going to go to the Serbian list parliamentary group. This is obstacle number one. Uh, then uh, if this does not work, we uh, are going to have a, 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 a period of time when uh, we are going to discuss on uh, who is going to establish the, a coalition uh, with Kurti, whether it will be AAK or any other political party. And then the biggest obstacle comes, and that is the election of the president. As we know, we need at least 80 members of parliament to be in the assembly hall uh, when uh, the president is uh, voted in order for that vote to be legitimate. So in this sense, I think that again, we uh, will see some discussions among political parties on how to establish the two third majority for the president, uh, which uh, uh, might be uh, Ms. Osmani from the Vendosia ticket or might be someone else if uh, they don't find a breakthrough on, on, on this book. And once these obstacles, the institutional and procedural obstacles are passed, then we are going to have the, uh, the major obstacles and the major uh, uh, or, or difficulties, challenges uh, posed to the government. The first one being obviously dealing with the pandemic uh, during the uh, election campaign, and especially because of the election campaign, we see now the numbers that are uh, becoming very high in Kosovo. We have a lot of economic problems related to the pandemic, which should have been addressed last year, but they were not addressed. Last year, uh, our, our economy uh, actually contracted by 6.5%. Uh, and then we have the issue, the ever-present issue of dialogue, where Kurti has always been evasive and ambiguous into his uh, intentions and the way that he's going to deal with the dialogue. And he was very ambiguous, even uh, this time when he went with the uh, with the ambassador Leitschak uh, that he visited Pristina uh, at the beginning of this uh, of this week. So in this sense, uh, I think that uh, what, what we might expect from uh, from a, a Kurdish government, especially in the immediate uh, uh, future, is that he will insist to deal with internal problems, as we call them, uh, and we have a lot of those uh, economic and social problems, and environmental problems, uh, health problems. Uh, but I think that at the same time, uh, uh, we are going to see an amount in pressure, especially from Washington, Brussels and Berlin, in order for the dialogue to continue and use this as it was always called the window of opportunity to try and reach an agreement with President Vucic using his uh, 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 authority and uh, strength, uh, political strength in Serbia. Uh, which uh, which is uh, always a challenge for Kosovo because uh, 
as we uh, know, we have had the process of dialogue that started in 2011, and the new government is proposing that we need to oversee uh, or, or, or uh, look into the dialogue and see what has worked and what not, and try to, uh, to use any means possible in order for the dialogue to be uh, changed, both in principle and in agenda. Uh, and uh, what we are getting so far, at least from our international or Western partners, is that the dialogue has to continue and not start from scratch. So in this sense, I think that this is one of the biggest clashes that I see between uh, what Kurti expects of the dialogue from uh, with Serbia uh, uh, and uh, compared to what the others expect from that dialogue. And uh, uh, to, to conclude, I think that one of the uh, challenges as well, which uh, Kurti needs to is going to face is uh, related to the democracy in Kosovo. Uh, I think that with this sort of a victory and with the with the political or populist discourse that we have heard uh, increasingly from Kurti, I think that uh, we might see some challenges to our democracy. As we have seen in his 50 days of uh, governance, uh, the decisions taken to uh, address uh, the uh, rising numbers of COVID-19 cases have all been uh, 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 assessed as non-constitutional at that time by the constitutional courts. So I think that in this uh, uh, sense, we have a sort of like not a very good experience when it comes to the way that Kurti will uh, lead its government. And the final, uh, which is one of the uh, biggest challenges as well for Kurti is uh, related to democracy, but especially related to the uh, relationship that he is going to build with the representative of uh, minority communities and especially with the representatives of Kosovo Serbs, uh, judging and, and because of the history, the way that the Bendosia has been built as a left-wing nationalistic sort of a political movement, I think that uh, it is especially uh, challenging for Kurti to build this uh, sort of a relationship, which is necessary uh, for any government in Kosovo to have a successful governance. Thank you so much, Visar. You so well set the stage for, for the next two questions that I wanted to ask of the next two panelists. Um, uh, with your penultimate question on uh, challenges to democracy, I thought it would be great actually to bring in Lavdim now and ask about what is the situation now with media in Kosovo? How was it to cover these elections? Um, we've seen that there were some recent attacks on journalists. Uh, what what can you tell us? And then I will we'll go to Jovana to speak about the challenge in building relationships with Serbs. Thank you, Valeri. Given that Vlura and Visar tackled some of the issues which are of crucial importance, I thought of starting my intervention with a topic that you have heard before and which is getting serious worry in Kosovo, violence against journalists. It is true that violence against journalists is not a new phenomenon. However, just in the past few weeks, we had several attacks against two well-known journalists, Valenzuela and Visar Dorici. They were attacked for exercising their right to speak freely. Also, it is no news that authorities are not doing much when it comes to chasing the perpetrators. What is new, however, is that the new cases are producing discourses that are extreme and dangerous. In social media, comments following these two cases of attacks were mainly negative against journalists. Since there are indeed provo provocative journalists, the comments were saying something like they asked for it. With such response, which comes also from political supporters and in the style of political propaganda, we are creating an environment where everyone in Kosovo can believe it is very much okay to beat a journalist. This hatred against journalists has increased, especially by the supporters of the party that won the elections. Turning to the topic of this panel, the election has revealed strong indicators of through and systematic control of the media by political agendas, be that between parties or between candidates in one party. What is more worrying? However, is that we are seeing in Kosovo a very similar discourse that we have seen in the region in total support of the winning party. Having been in opposition most of their life, Vedvendose is seen as a hope. This is why it was voted by many. Here, many media 
and civil society organizations have totally lost their objectivity and ran full on to support Vedran Dossier during the election campaign. Even before the new government is formed, such media and public figures, many of whom were continuously supported by the donor community, are becoming the amplifiers of the new government. This is, of course, not new for Kosovo, but is new the extent to which has gone now. At Front Online, we have witnessed this politicization firsthand. I was chief editor of the second daily newspaper, and I was brutally told to publish the cover page interview with the chairman of the political party without editing it. We had to leave overnight. We established Front with the hope that all credibility would attract sponsors and advertisement, and it did. Then COVID-19 happened, and if it weren't for EED support, we would be closed and our team of 15 men and women would not exist. But donor support now is more important than ever for Kosovo, especially for, for the media. It has become very common for media to be set up to work for a single politician, let alone for a group or of them or a party. Only last year, more than 50 million euros were invested in Kosovo in televised media during the time when all media are facing financial hardship. The question is how come this money is entering to the Kosovo media scene now? The disbalance this has caused is yet to be seen. COVID-19 hit all the media. This also opened the path for more political influence. In Kosovo, similarly to the Western Balkan region, biggest advertisers are public institutions or companies that have contracts with those institutions. Hence, political control of advertisement is a fact. With COVID-19 crisis, this control became stronger. At the same time, the political war became dirtier. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Levdim, for those insights about, about how difficult it is now to, to be a journalist. Although I do think that Kosovo has, has one of the better media freedom uh, indicators in, in the region anyways, but, but still it's challenging uh, to be a journalist in most countries in the world uh, and especially in the Balkans. Um, Jovala, I want to come to you now and, and ask you how all of this is being perceived uh, among Kosovo Serbs who are often portrayed as being stuck between, you know, being a small minority in Kosovo and uh, being used as a pawn by, by Belgrade uh, for, for the Serbian government's political uh, wishes and political machinations. Um, can you speak a little bit about what it was, what this election, what's been going on, what was going on during the election, some of the allegations of fraud and some of the violence also that has happened uh, after the election? Thanks. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, to start off, maybe there's not much to add really before the after the, the previous speakers, but it's uh, really interesting to kind of make a parallel between the elections in 2019 and uh, this year's election when you have kind of a, the same enthusiasm in the media frenzy, uh, especially around the Vetman dossier, maybe this year a little less, but then the expectations were, were very high. And uh, Arbin Kurti also um, kind of uh, participated in building these expectations uh, by announcing these general policies. So it's going to be really interesting now in the, in the future to see um, when we start talking about the delivery. And there will be a lot of understanding uh, needed for um, the change and changes that are actually paradigm shifting um, uh, because we need to take into consideration uh, both the time, but also the political stability, which is something that has not been uh, quite a characteristic of Kosovo um, in a sense, in comparison, for example, to the um, uh, actually in relation to the past years. But specifically speaking of the, the Kosovo Serb community and the non-majority communities, I think that with this year we did have some sort of a precedent. I think it took roots actually back in 2019 in the pre-election campaign when we had the prominent uh, uh, individuals from the Kosovo Albanian community actually uh, calling for the voters who do not know for whom to vote to actually cast a vote for the opposition coming from 
uh, the Serbian community and non Srpska lista uh, candidate. In this case, this is specifically calling to vote for Nenad Rašić. In this, this didn't really have any uh, much of the success back in 2019, but now we see that uh, potentially this has been happening, but initiated from a different side. So there are allegations, uh, even in the pre-election uh, period during the campaign and now even after the elections when we see the pre preliminary results, that um, allegations that Srpska Lista has actually incited the votes for other non-majority community candidates, specifically speaking uh, here about uh, the candidate from uh, political subject from the Bosnian community, political subject from the the Roma community, as well as to kind of a long-term ally of the MP from the political subject from the Gorani community. Uh, I also need to kind of make a, a, a disclaimer here as well, actually uh, to mention a thing that there had been also accusation in Betven dossier for this specific thing, uh, especially coming from the political candidates from the Turkish community, that the Betven dossier was also in a way inciting voting for the specific non-majority community options. And this could be seen uh, publicly with the, pub, uh, with the ra joint rallies of the Albin Kurti with uh, candidates from Bosnian community, Egyptian community, and even rallying with uh, Nena Drasic, uh, who was this time not a political candidate, but a supporting a specific Kosovo Serb, uh, Srpska Lista opposition option. So uh, in that sense, now when we are waiting for the final votes, uh, we see that, and I, I believe that the constitution, uh, the conditional votes, uh, uh, when they are actually counted, might uh, disrupt the current uh, kind of allocation of the MP seats uh, for the non-Serb, non-majority communities. Um, this is yet to be seen, but there are allegations actually that these uh, non-majority communities will be allied with Serbsk list and forming this um, um, parliamentary group. Um, yet this is this is going to be seen. Um, uh, again, this will be very important to, to emphasize that we have a growing criticism uh, now uh, coming from the international community as well as from the, the Kosovo public uh, of the, the kind of the, the, the shrinking space in the Serb community and uh, the Serb is solidifying its uh, role in the kind of the political scene, the lack of opposition uh, within the community itself. It is the direct consequences, a consequence of 2013 and signing of the Brussels Agreement and the first election held a municipal election 2013 when the uh, integration process of the Northern municipality started. And uh, considering and going back to the atmosphere that we had back then and the will of the Serb community to actually integrate into Kosovo institutions, it was the only way forward to secure political participation um, by one then citizen initiative and now political party that has uh, actually now to stay captured all of the um, uh, municipal, central and local level uh, institutions. So in a sense, during the campaign itself, we from the political, um, I was closely observing the elections and uh, even talked to the political subjects. And it was really interesting to see this time that the opposition from the Kosovo Serb community uh, did not complain about uh, the threats or violence or anything else, which was actually a pattern in the previous, previous elections. It seems like that this is, um, been uh, missing or it was not really a method used this time. But then there was um, a specific incident that happened right after the election and, and it actually is related to the to the fight in, in which the son of the, uh, the, the opposition politician and Adrashic has been participating. And I would like to actually mention this, uh, this very um, very briefly, because uh, there had been kind of different interpretation of what has really happened, and, and it's not on me because I'm not representing institutions to to actually say that. But the official interpretation of the police very much differs from what we have heard from Nenad Rashid in regarding to the fight uh, or after the uh, and uh, because the the police claims that the incident happened uh, uh, it actually it was a pre-organized fight. So a lot of media attention was given and put on Rashid and his son, um, uh, while there were others that were hurt uh, in the same incident. And there was actually one minor as well, who actually has filed the criminal charges against the son of Nenad Rashid. Um, so, and this side of the story has been very much ignored by the Kosovo Albanian uh, media. So in that respect, I would like to kind of refrain from, from any comment until the, the police and the prosecution do their job. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> sorry, given the, the bad press, the Nenad Rašić was after the bad press in the Serbian language, 
um, it, I would not be surprised that his son has actually went through um, bullying or um, or feeling the consequences of this of this campaign. But on the other hand, we had the parents uh, of these detained uh, participants in the find that keep underlying the fact that uh, this incident first would not be scrutinized if uh, Naren Rashi's son was not involved and if it didn't happen right after the elections. Um, and one more thing, because I spoke about Naren Rashi quite a lot, I would also kind of like to touch base a little bit on the um, uh, Batman dossier and the messaging that uh, it actually led to um, uh, this landslide victory, the, the messaging of the anti-corruption economic development and then uh, uh, issues that are um, uh, actually very much different from the kind of the losers in, in the, the political campaign. Um, it is really interesting to see that, uh, you know, in the public discourse, we saw Rashid kind of being brought up as the, the alternative, the Kosovo Serb to talk to and to be in the government, while this is the person that has actually is currently being tried for corruption. Um, and, um, well, on the other hand, one of the main pillars of the veteran dossier is pretty much fighting against corruption. So this is very interesting. In the, to conclude with this, uh, in uh, the forming of the government, it is going to be interesting what kind of role Srpska list is going to play. Um, we have seen that in 2019, Srpska list was not on, uh, part of the government coalition, even though by the constitution, the Serb representatives need to be represented in the government. Um, so I, I don't expect that there will be much of a change this time. Um, and um, it will also be interesting to see uh, how the new government is going to be proceeding with the with the internal dialogue with the communities, which has been emphasized in the in the previous period. Thank you so much, Jovana. Uh, we originally envisioned kind of two rounds of of, uh, of back and forth before going to Fiola and opening it up to the audience. But I think since we've been talking already for 50 minutes, I wanted to um, come to you, Fiola, to to respond to some of what you heard um, and and to to comment on how you see these current developments and the possible new government uh, from from Brussels and also from Berlin. Well, yes, since I'm an MP, um, MEP in, uh, in Brussels, I think it's fairer to try to comment from here and not uh, on behalf of uh, my colleagues in the, in the Bundestag or even on behalf of the, the German government. Um, nevertheless, I think we have heard a very diverse, very interesting, very honest and, and very fair picture of uh, what is ahead um, of us in Kosovo. And uh, I fully share maybe the first let's say joint observation that we have to regulate and calibrate, calibrate a little bit this expectation management. I do see this is almost impossible yeah, to, to uh, live up to this. I mean, uh, whether it was Kurdi himself or just the frustration of, of the party failure of the others or just the um, overall setting where Kosovo is now in and also I, I would include with the mismanagement of coming from, from the um, member states, I would rather exclude uh, the commission when it comes to the visa liberalization. I see that the commission maybe has responsibility in other um, uh, uh, fields, but especially the high frustration of the majority of the people, ordinary citizen that is still not given green light for the visa liberalization. It is uh, absolutely understandable. And uh, as the ambassador and all the others have said, I mean, I, I, I try to um, announce this everywhere where I am and we really push hard and we can only hope uh, that uh, in the second half of the year, um, after maybe we have more bilateral talks, especially with the government of France and the French president, we can figure out what is their main, let's say, concern and why are they so reluctant on, on, on giving this little state, this little country um, with one point, I don't know, eight, nine million maximum um, this, this visa-free regime, while many others with Ukraine, for example, with 40 millions uh, um, already um, uh, enjoy uh, this visa-free regime. And um, I mean, to be honest, um, everything is still calm and peaceful. So I do not see 
uh, too much to fear uh, in, in case of Kosovo's um, travel um, possibilities. Uh, when it comes to the dialogue, uh, this is a little bit, I don't know, it's the hen or the egg. Um, why, why we know that uh, we have to, even there are so many internal problems and, and, and Koti is right on saying, hey, this is now my priority. But of course, many of us were a little bit, uh, let's say, um, uh, puzzled uh, that uh, the dialogue uh, has not even shown up in the uh, in this program, his, his, his electoral program, and not was not really on a um, uh, in the campaign mentioned many times, neither by him or by by Osmani, But I think they have. Uh, uh, maybe understood uh, that without any kind of even intending to participate, this will be a hard time for all of us. Uh, while we are the friends of Kosovo and we would like to uh, support and assist as much as we can, we also need uh, the other hand from Kosovo to show um, the uh, the recipients or the um, political actors uh, working on this dialogue as well. Um, I do understand that we should really stop dealing uh, democracy for dialogue. Uh, this is uh, mainly maybe also addressed to Serbia, while I see that uh, we should really work on both fronts. But uh, when it comes to, to, to Kosovo, we need, uh, let's say, a structure, we need an I don't know, any kind of an institution, a ministry, um, what you have uh, led or what you have headed for quite a while, the Ministry for Euro Integration or you ever uh, want to call it, but something where Brussels can, can work uh, with and where donor um, coordination uh, will take part, uh, will take yeah, uh, place and so on. Um, I was I was shocked to hear that the violence against journalists has uh, risen uh, significantly. I mean, we have let's say I don't want to uh, put this in the, in a context, but of course in the Western Balkan states we have cases all over, uh, and this is of a high concern. And so far, I thought that uh, media freedom is, I would say, much better respected so far in Kosovo than in the surrounding, in the neighboring states. So there was, I, 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 of course, we have um, been aware of the last two cases, but that this is a general trend um, I wasn't aware of, uh, that that was very important uh, for me uh, to take. Um, and I fully share, and since I was the chief observer for the last SNAP election, um, in uh, this, on the 6th of October 2019, we are, of course, fully aware of all the shortcomings when it comes to elections. And party financing was one of the major topics we have covered. Um, and I know that, of course, none of our 53 um, recommendations in this report, neither uh, in October 2019 nor before, was ever implemented. And so this is maybe my personal, but also uh, the hope from the European Union that after uh, the new government will be formed, uh, this recommendation will not be forgotten. While all of them, all political uh, actors suffer under the shortcomings and they know exactly what needs to be done. Some are more technical um, uh, nature of or more technical nature. Some are really like constitutional and legislative uh, nature, but nevertheless, this needs to be tackled as soon as possible when the government or after the government has um, has been formed. And this will at least I will remind them um, many times. Um, hopefully, after the pandemic and uh, traveling will be will be possible. So um, overall, I think. Um, also, our expectations are high, but maybe not as high as uh, the ones um, of the citizens of Kosovo themselves. Um, I see also that partly um, this landslide victory, whether you want to call it or not, is driven by a protest vote. But otherwise, I think that for the first time, we could also see like a programmatic approach to the electoral um, electorate and uh, that, that that is really 
of 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 yeah of a high concern of many people to have better education to have a fairer i mean a um, higher standard in the health uh, uh, system so the social issues and when you have to live in a region where the um, the air quality, especially in wintertime, is so poorly. Of course, um, you should push your politicians at some point to improve this. And if this will be picked up by the new government, I think this is, um, let's say, uh, of, of a common interest uh, for, for, for Kosovo as such. So um, I fully share also the uh, impression of, I think, the ambassador, um, the um, increasing influence of Russia and China in the Western Balkan states in general. And uh, we have discussed that many times now in our uh, committee, um, special committee on um, uh, interference. Um, this is of high concern and we have to have uh, better addresses, more targeted, more tailored um, answers to this. Um, hopefully we can imply like proper investment, uh, better investment, um, modernizing uh, the region with the European money uh, more than we have done in the in the past, uh, for sure. But nevertheless, this so-called Chinese um, loans and Chinese credits are sometimes so easy uh, to, to get that I guess the, the competition will stay high. Okay, I'll leave it for this maybe for now. Um, and it could be more political when it comes to uh, this Washington agreement. I don't want to go um, into this. I hope uh, that we will, uh, you said uh, we are, were always complementary. Yes, but nevertheless, it would be helpful if we pulled on the same side of, of the rope. And that didn't happen during the last four years. And that created a lot of turbulence and that created a lot of also frustration, at least in Brussels, when you have one player in Washington playing only unilaterally. So I see there is at least not just a window of opportunity, but also um, a joint interest from both sides to work uh, in, a, in a more in line, um, um, in, 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 in uh, cooperation um, for the next, hopefully, three, four years together. And this will be um, for the benefit of the people in Kosovo, I'm pretty sure. Thank you so much, Ms. Van Kramon. Um, we have half an hour left and we have a few audience questions. So I might go to those, although I might also abuse my position as moderator and uh, come up with some more of my own. Um, and it's nice to see so many questions coming in from familiar names and faces. Um, we have a question actually from Michael Warren, um, which is posed for Jovan and Visar, but I also want to ask Ambassador Chitaku to respond to it since it's um, uh, related to some of the work that you've also done in your career. Uh, but I will go to Visar first, maybe, and then ask um, Lora to respond. So uh, this is a question from Michael Warren, who's asking um, about the dialogue. Um, uh, Kurti has made it clear that he will not spend political capital on seeking progress in the dialogue with Belgrade, and polls seem to show that most ethnic Albanian voters endorse this. Um, is there sufficient political space for his idea of a dialogue with Serb citizens as opposed to dialogue with Serbia? Are there political forces in the Serb communities that could reciprocate to the benefit of those Serb communities? And can Kurti stick to that path given the likelihood of pressure from Brussels to return to the dialogue as we heard uh, from Ms. Krom von Kramon's intervention um, and implement previous agreements, etc. And uh, you know, I remember when we first met in 2014 over a coffee in uh, on Mother Teresa Street, you were talking to me about Vendosia's uh, plans for, for internal dialogue um, when you were chairman of the party. Um, is that still an idea that, that you think is viable or has that ship sailed? I think that, uh, well, first and foremost, uh, uh, this dialogue should not be misunderstood as a substitute to the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, because we are talking about two different things. And I think that although they are related and both of the issues have been addressed by the uh, uh, Brussels dialogue so far. So the relationship between Kosovo and Serbia plus the position of 
uh, 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 Kosovo serves within the society and the economy of Kosovo. But uh, I think that uh, from uh, the Vendosi idea, this was sometimes seen as a substitute and sometimes was just as a, a simple idea that we should bring uh, people together regardless of their ethnic background in order to build together a republic of citizens. And I think that uh, uh, this is a sort of a dialogue that we actually need in the Republic of Kosovo. I think that uh, 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 non-majority communities should be a part of uh, building Kosovo as an independent republic, which should uh, 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 serve to equal citizens. Uh, but I think that uh, when it comes to Kurti and uh, to answer the question whether he will be able to do this, I think that uh, uh, he, his intentions are uh, right. I think that he would like to do it. Uh, but uh, as uh, Jovana said earlier, uh, uh, I see it as a problematic if Kurti wants to do it by selecting who represents Kosovo Serbs. I mean, it is not up to the government of Kosovo, neither the prime minister of Kosovo, uh, to uh, actually choose who are the Serbs that he or she would deem uh, 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 as good enough uh, to talk to. So in this sense, I think that it is up to Serbs living in Kosovo to elect and select their representatives. And those political representatives are the ones that we uh, are, or, or the government in Kosovo, the prime minister of Kosovo, uh, need to talk to and address the issues that are to be addressed. Although I think that as a prime minister, and I would expect Kurti to do this, unfortunately, he didn't do it. And when he had the chance during the, uh, the uh, campaign, I think that he would need to be more approachable to uh, the non-Albanian communities in Kosovo and speak directly to the people of Kosovo. Uh, in Mitrovica, in Kamenica, in Lipian, in Prizren, and in all other municipalities where we have non-majority communities living, I think that the Prime Minister of Kosovo and all of the uh, 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 institutional leads of Kosovo need to talk directly to the people there and see how can the Republic of Kosovo serve better uh, their interests and needs. So to conclude the question, I think that Kurti would like to do that, uh, that uh, dialogue. I think that uh, uh, so far he has understood that that cannot be a substitute to the uh, uh, Kosovo-Serbia uh, uh, dialogue. But I think that he would need to be a bit more brave when it comes to these issues and start uh, talking to the citizens of Kosovo uh, directly uh, without uh, uh, having this electoral fear uh, of himself looking as not, not patriotic or not nationalistic enough. How do you think his core voter base would actually respond if he if he started doing that, going around to to communities, speaking in Serbian, holding speeches, have listening to people? Well, I think that you know, I mean, I mean, unfortunately, we have an atmosphere in Kosovo as anywhere else in the countries of the region where uh, 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 where this nationalistic sentiment is still alive. Uh, but I think is uh, that uh, Kurti uh, would be the proper politician to do that because of his background, because of uh, the way that uh, he built upon and uh, the political discourse and the way that he presented this, himself as this uh, the uh, national uh, father figure and the national savior. So I think that he has the uh, the the credential, uh, the political credential and legitimacy in order to uh, uh, address this issue and start breaking these prejudices. Uh, when it comes to the minds of the people. He also have the electoral vote. Uh, he is one of the most voted, I would say, uh, political leaders uh, in the uh, post-war period. So in this sense, it would be, uh, uh, I, I see him as uh, uh, the best uh, politician in order to start behaving differently when it comes to the relationship between the prime minister and the non-majority community the citizens of Kosovo. Thank you so much. Uh, Jovan, I just want to ask you quickly, how do you think uh, citizens would react? I mean, I, I remember during many years of my reporting, uh, some Serbs would say, look, we just, we don't want to have Tachi. He's dogged by all these allegations. We know what Albin was doing uh, for, for most of the war. We, we can trust him. And yet, I don't know if I could necessarily imagine all of those people going to a town hall and sitting down to listen. I, do you think there is a willingness or, or an ability, there would be an ability to build the trust on on a listening tour of Serb majority municipalities. 
Well, this is very interesting because when you when you look at the numbers and you see the turnout in the Serb majority municipalities, you see the highest uh, record high uh, turnouts uh, in, in the Kosovo elections. On the other hand, the such interest in the Kosovo institutional uh, life and uh, political life in general is of very low interest to the Serb community in Kosovo. It's very contradictory, but I think it's, it just shows the kind of the complexity of the position the Kosovo Serb community uh, is in, and uh, especially in the circumstances of this uh, um, dialogue in a stalemate, I mean, at least on the political level, and uh, uh, no solution in sight, even though they are kind of this... Uh, a very optimistic expectation from Mr. Lychak that, you know, it's about months now to, to ex see some sort of a deal, but I really don't see that happening. In, re in regards to the internal dialogue, um, I don't see any argument against and including the non-majority communities and, and um, the Serb community living in Kosovo as well. The question is why didn't it happen sooner? And the biggest question is who are the people who will be actually participating in this internal dialogue? It is very, um, I think, very dangerous uh, and, and non realistic to think that, you know, the putting on the side the, the ways of how the certain political subjects got their votes and got like is representing the government. They are representatives of the specific ethnic group. And in this sense, they 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 hold the 10 out of 10 MPCs. They hold 10 out of 10 uh, Serbian majority municipalities. And it's really unrealistic to, to, to believe that uh, they can be actually bypassed in this process. So it really needs to go through the political representatives and then down to the, the community. For me, actually, it's, it's more interesting to, to think about what will be the topics of these uh, internal dialogues? What will they, uh, the, the, what, what would they uh, be discussing about? Um, it, it will be very interesting to see. Again, it is, uh, as uh, Vistar mentioned, uh, this can never, it, it cannot replace the, the dialogue that is happening between Belgrade and Pristina, but it can actually uh, be uh, a nice uh, addition to it. Um, so it will be, I mean, I would personally like to see that happening. What, what are the top three topics that would lure you to this meeting uh, besides uh, free chips and drinks? Well, me personally, coming from the civil society, I don't think that I would be uh, caring about the, or, or prioritizing the topics and issues uh, as uh, as uh, uh, another Kosovo Serb citizen. But I believe that probably the main issues uh, addressed would be the Akhtisari package and the implementation of the law, because um, this is the kind of the biggest concern that we hear from the Kosovo Serb community and uh, the, the lack of trust in the Kosovo institution is the fact that the, in practice, um, the law is not being respected, for example, from the law on the official languages or the, the respect of the kind of this uh, uh, quota for the, um, the civil servants represented in the institutions and so on. So I believe those would probably be the topics that would be com coming first for like a regular citizen. And do you feel like there would be intimidation uh, or threats or, or that, that it would create actually tension uh, if, if such meetings were announced? And do you think that there are structures uh, which m may try to prevent people from, from Serp, ethnic Serbs from participating in, in these kind of dialogue or meetings? Well, first of all, I'm not sure how high the interest would be of the community to actually take part. But uh, I think everything would very much depend on the on the inclusion of the political representatives, actually the, the um, uh, coordination and consultation with uh, with Srpska in this case. Uh, I, as I said, I, I don't I don't think that it is realistic to expect that the internal dialogue can happen with the Kosovo Serb community with bypassing the, the only political representative they have in the, in the government. Thanks. Um, you mentioned the Atisari package, and uh, we had a question also from, from an old friend, uh, Felix, uh, who, who notes, and I will ask Vlora and maybe come back to you, Jovana, and I still have a question for you, Lavdim, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> my question is, or Felix's question is, that successive election observation missions have noted that democratic campaigns and elections are vibrant and largely fair amongst Kosovo Albanian population, um, but amongst uh, 
Kosovo Serbs, this is not the case. Is Kosovo's Atisari model of ethnically based political parties broken? Uh, and what can the new government do to overcome this? Um, Vlora, you were very actively involved in the Atisari negotiations, I think even trying to set up some of the uh, meetings among ethnic Serbs communities in Kosovo in 2006 and seven. Uh, what do you think about Felix's question? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, well, that's, a, that's a, a very good question. And it's actually very intertwined with uh, what we've dis been discussing in the last uh, half an hour. Um, I must say that it is paradoxical to ask or to claim that the positive um, discrimination and affirmative rights should be revisited. I think Kosovo loses nothing from uh, Atisari plan and from uh, its ability to give um, and to extend uh, uh, rights to its uh, Serbian and other non-Albanian communities. The problem in Kosovo, and this is something we've encountered with Atisari plan, but also what we're seeing now, in Kosovo, we need to accept and realize that the problem we have is not with Kosovo Serbs. Our problem is with Belgrade. And as long as we have a problem with Belgrade, uh, we will have serious problems with integration of the Serbian population in Kosovo. We can do we can come up with a new model, we can abolish Atisari and create something new, the problem will still be there. And you see a problem with the integration of Serbian communities, not only in Kosovo, but you see it in Bosnia, you see it in Croatia, we've seen it in Montenegro. Serbia has always used uh, Serbian population outside of its political borders to as, as an instrument of their malign foreign policy. And while I remember during Atisari's uh, process, uh, we were talking to the Serbian community in Kosovo, we were addressing their concerns. When the moment came to come at the assembly and sign the declaration of independence, the representatives of the Serbian political parties, and those were not Lista Srpska, refused to attend not because they maybe did not agree with what we were doing that day on the assembly, but because they simply cannot. So what I'm trying to say is that the dialogue with Serbia and dialogue with Kosovo Serbs are not mutually exclusive. We can and we should do both. With one difference, the dialogue with Belgrade must have a timeline. The dialogue with local Serbs must continue always. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I wanted to switch gears and come back a bit to this, this democratic uh, side and, and to ask Lavdim, um, what was it like to, to cover the elections? Um, and what do you think you, you, the journalistic community can expect now with, with, uh, with Vetvan Dosje in power? Yes, <clears throat> their officials have shown in many cases very bad discourse towards media. During the election campaign, we had interview uh, with Mr. Kurti just twice in one TV station, and he refused to go in the media who criticized him. We had the invitation from several TV stations, and he refused to, to present and to answer to question might have journalists there, and he decided to go just in one TV station twice. And this is not good. <laughs> and, 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 but ha have they been transparent uh, in terms of, you know, financing? What, what do you expect from, from, from them in power? What, what are you seeing so far in terms of the kind of transparency, willingness to host press conferences, to, to give more interviews? Uh, yes, I, I hope, I hope that they will change their uh, approach towards media 
and will cooperate, will help us to, to the documents, etc. Thank you. Um, Visar, I want to ask you a bit uh, about uh, what you said um, comparing um, soon to be Prime Minister Kurti to, to a messianic figure. And I wanted to ask you if you think that's more potentially dangerous for him or more potentially dangerous for Kosovo. Uh, and I also wanted to ask you, you know, I've been to, I don't know how many protests with I don't know how many thousands of people where you always hear the slogan of Vetvendosia, yo negoziata Vetvendosia, no negotiations. Like now uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Kurti will, will be sitting in the prime ministerial chair and he will have to inevitably make a lot of compromises. Uh, is that, uh, a skill in his toolbox well, you know you've seen a lot more of the internal uh machinations of the party um and his governance style than i have well uh, whether it's going to be more problematic for him rather than us i think that uh, uh if he really believes it is going to be problematic for us if he doesn't it's going to be problematic for him uh, I'm talking about the Messianic uh, figure because I think that uh, not just Mr. Kurti but everyone else uh, should be aware that uh, once in power, once in government, there are certain limitations to what you can do. And uh, because of those limitations, obviously that Kosovo can be governed in a better way than we have seen so far, uh, but not in a much better way. So we have to be aware of that. And in this sense, I think that uh, it was Vedvendosia and especially Kurti through, as I said earlier, through a sort of like populist discourse that created this sort of a uh, perception and expectation that all you need is different names and different people at the head of the institutions and every pain and ill that we have suffered so far will go away. And obviously that is not going to be the case. And that's why I think it is very important for Kosovo's democracy, especially and for Kosovo's uh, political future, uh, to have a government uh, led by Mr. Kurti, which is not going to be brought down in 50 days and therefore uh, let the people or the others see that uh, not just that Kurti is not a messianic figure, but we cannot have a Jesus-like figure in politics and nobody has the magic wand in order for Kosovo to become automatically and over the night a better, uh, uh, a much better place. So in this sense, I think that it is positive uh, uh, what is uh, going to happen in Kosovo. Uh, and it is positive that I still uh, believe and think that uh, obviously Kurti is going to do some reforms uh, which are going to put Kosovo on a better track uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, when also and always uh, facing the potential risk uh, that we might have in, especially when it comes to the democratic governance, as I said, of the country and especially abiding to the laws and procedures and to the, uh, to the, uh, the maxim of uh, 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 distribution of power between different institutions. So in this sense, I think that it is very important, uh, especially since we're talking to uh, to an European, if I may call, audience uh, to note that uh, Kosovo needs to be aided uh, still as a society and especially to the donors that uh, we need to maintain the focus within the civil society in Kosovo and uh, freedom of media and freedom of speech because these are the two elements that uh, are going to keep the new government as they did the, with the old governments in check. And uh, especially the European Union, uh, uh, sorry, European Endowment for Democracy, with their increased uh, uh, focus in Pristina and in Kosovo, are very helpful into maintaining this sort of a uh, objective analysis and objective criticism towards the government on uh, the democracy and uh, 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 human rights uh, uh, record. Uh, when it comes to the negotiations, I think that um, obviously Kurti is going to uh, to uh, uh, adhere to uh, to the uh, the agenda of uh, negotiations. I think that he will uh, do his utmost in order to try and change everything that is to be changed uh, within that uh, that uh, uh, the, the dialogue. I think that he is going to have the biggest problem when it comes to implementing these uh, the agreements reached so far. Uh, obviously, there is a general sentiment in Kosovo that uh, we need to implement those agreements because it is Serbia who has failed to implement the agreements, which is uh, uh, true, uh, but not the whole truth. 
because there are some agreements that we have not implemented either. And I think that one of them especially is unimplementable by Kurti the way that he has uh, 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 spoken so far, and that is the agreement on the association of uh, majority municipalities, which let's not forget is an agreement that we have ratified within our uh, uh, parliament as an international agreement, and therefore we bind to it. So, uh, so far, the way that Kurti has addressed this agreement, and uh, Ms. Osmani as well, is that uh, that agreement should not be implemented, and we need Serbia to implement everything that they have uh, signed for, uh, and uh, uh, we are not going to implement the only thing that we have not implemented so far. Now, I think that they will need to understand, and I think that they do understand, that negotiations and dialogue do not work in this manner. You cannot ask uh, 100% from the other party, while at the same time being 100% uh, 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 refusal, uh, uh, refusing everything that uh, comes to your uh, as a responsibility. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, what uh, what uh, might be the biggest problem in this uh, sort of uh, the way that uh, negotiations are uh, being uh, dealt with so far is that through public discourse, Kurti is again raising the expectations very high in order to use public uh, sentiment as an argument when talking to Brussels, when talking to Washington, when talking to Berlin on the dialogue. And I think that this is creating a potential uh, a severe backlash because if you raise the expectations and then do something else in the dialogue, uh, that will add to the frustration of the people and that will add to, to what we have seen uh, in, 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 with previous governments as well of having another, or yet another politician who says something totally different when campaigning and does something totally different when governing. So in this sense, I agree with Ms. Monkraman, it is that uh, it was very problematic that during the election campaign, we had no word about the dialogue with Serbia, and straight after elections were over, we, have, uh, we were told by the Prime Minister-elect that uh, it is a seventh or eighth priority, then it became the fourth priority, now it's the third priority, and we're going on, even before we have voted the government. Thank you so much, Visar. We uh, have only five minutes left. And actually, I, I thought uh, to ask one question to Jovana that, uh, that I didn't ask, uh, which is how, if, uh, and if so, how so, did the pandemic affect uh, Kosovo Serbs living in Kosovo relationship with the state of Kosovo? I mean, of course, um, uh, from all the Brussels agreement, which was 10 year anniversary we're celebrating this month or the negotiations um, that began, uh, you know, of course, uh, Serb communities still have access to the Serbian health education systems and so on. But, but do you see that, um, that, uh, that this pandemic has changed in any way, positive or negative uh, Serb relations with the Kosovo state? On a personal level, I mean, this is something that people experience so personally as well and emotionally. Thanks. Well, thank you, Valerie, for the question. Uh, I mean, it's been now a year, right, since the the, the starting of the the kind of the restrictions and the measures imposed uh, in Kosovo in regards to the pandemic, and uh, it was uh, quite confusing for the Serb community in Kosovo, especially those living in the north, because in the beginning it was still quite unclear what regulation should they follow, whether is that the Serbian rules and regulations, considering that the Kosovo Serb community is being treated in the Serbian healthcare system or the Kosovo rules and regulations, considering that the police is the one being in charge of kind of enforcing those. So it was, it was quite problematic in the beginning when everything was, um, uh, uh, in the end it was, of course, uh, the, the rules were, respected in accordance with the Kosovo uh, Ministry of Health. Uh, and uh, I actually have to say and compliment the current, the, actually the, the, the health minister from the Vetman Dossier government uh, uh, and the way how they were handling. And actually this is the overall kind of opinion in the Kosovo Serb community of the, um, uh, the responsiveness in the Serbian language and uh, the general kind of understanding of this uh, um, sensitivities. And I think this is the biggest problem here that this was the opportunity missed for the Kosovo institutions. Um, I mean, it's clear that the, the Kosovo Serbs are, and other communities as well uh, are being treated in the Serbian uh, healthcare system. And now they're actually undergoing the vaccination process and so on. So there is really no attachment to the Kosovo healthcare system. 
But again, this was the moment to uh, actually for the, the Kosovo institutions to show strength and inclusion. Uh, there were a lot of um, uh, complaints in regards to the, the lack of translation, especially in to regards to the very important pandemic related information, uh, the late translation or the uh, improper translation that actually can be very, very problematic. So um, I wish to see that this could have been like actually held better. But then this is on the local level, on the, the kind of more uh, the Pristina Belgrade level, this was also one opportunity that could have been uh, an opening for improvement of the relations. Uh, and again, unfortunately, even in this uh, uh, cases of the, the worldwide pandemic, we do have the political um, issues coming in front and uh, any sort of cooperation can be seen as a weakness and a collaboration and, and actually portrayed negatively in one society. So um, again, this is kind of another negative element to it. Thank you, thanks. Um, there's one major thing that we haven't talked about and I'm conscious that we have one minute left officially, but I, I just want to ask Ambassador Chitako very quickly and briefly uh, about uh, the Washington Agreement uh, that was signed uh, in what seems like a past uh, era, uh, the, the Trump era, uh, about how much of that you expect, uh, expect uh, the new government to honor. I think we've seen that uh, Mr. Kurti has said that he plans to open the embassy uh, and visit Israel. Uh, but, but, but what's your take on that agreement now with the Biden administration in place? Will Serbia honor, do its part is, and, uh, and uh, what, are, what should Kosovo's obligations be? Thank you very much, uh, Valerie, and I'll be very brief. Um, I would never want to see Kosovo on the list of countries that do not honor agreements that they've signed. Uh, most importantly, because the Washington Agreement, just like uh, uh, the agreements we've signed in Brussels, are actually good for Kosovo. Um, of course, uh, the Washington Agreement uh, only covers the economical normalization. Um, and as such, uh, there is nothing uh, Kosovo should be afraid of. Uh, I really, I if I would give one advice to, to Kurti, that would be it. Uh, we should honor international agreements that we've signed in Washington and in Brussels. Uh, Secretary Blinken uh, actually, um, uh, brought Kosovo-Serbia dialogue as one of the very few, in his mind, very few successes of the Trump administration. And uh, both Mr. Palmer and other interlocutors at the State Department have made it clear that the Biden administration stands firmly behind the agreements that were signed. So I really hope that uh, the new government in Kosovo will honor the agreements and uh, we will move forward because um, the elephant in the room is the mutual recognition, and uh, that is the main topic we should be talking about in the future. Thank you so much, Vyora, and thank you so much to all of you who've spent the last hour and a half with us. Um, I hope that uh, you heard something new and interesting uh, and thought-provoking. And with that, I would like to end this panel and wish everyone uh, and, uh, and a wonderful afternoon. So thank you very much and tung tung. Bye. Thanks, Valeria. Thanks, everyone.